Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are strictly the views or opinions of the presenter. Nothing in here is the view of the firms, corporations, financial entities that anybody represents. Uh, Nothing expressed here is a view of any um, regulator or semi-regulatory agency. Uh, All content is intended to be educational. Nothing in this episode construes specific investment advice. And if you do require advice, you should seek an appropriate advisor, be that a financial planner or a tax advisor or possibly a lawyer. This is Jason Watt, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. Uh, This episode is kind of a mix of stuff. It'll be good for uh, life insurance credits in all jurisdictions. However, uh, we have to be careful with BC credits now. In BC, for life insurance credits to apply, the content has to be, I'm going to say, directly relevant to uh, life insurance. So I'm going to suggest that if you're in BC, you're only going to use this episode for a 0.5 life insurance credit. It'll be good for one life credit and no ANS in Alberta and then life credits in all other jurisdictions. Um, We could, for a financial planning credit with FP Canada, an IAS credit with Advocus, a professional development credit with IROC, and an MFDA financial planning process credit. The uh, episode here is kind of a a mixed bag. Uh, We're gonna have, first off, the last chunk of my three-part recording. So I recorded three parts from the Institute of Advanced Financial Planners Conference, and the first two filled one episode. And then I recorded about 40 minutes of content from the Financial Therapy Association Conference, and that's going to fill the bulk of this. So it's a one-hour episode, um, but from two different conferences. I hope that works out okay. I'd be interested to hear. This was how I could optimize the number of credits, which is my primary goal, of course, along with learning. So I hope that this works out nicely for your credits. Okay, the uh, object, um, if you look over my shoulder, my right shoulder here in this vicinity, you'll see the harbor, the old harbor at uh, the Ville de Quebec, the port of Quebec or city of Quebec, I guess the harbor at uh, the harbor of Quebec. Um, And that will be the object for today is the Quebec Harbor. Thanks very much and enjoy the two, the two-part series here. Thank you. I'm back at home now, having come back from the IFP symposium, and I'm going to now talk about uh, day three, and then there was a little bit on day four. We had just a half day, which uh, I thought was a nice way to run it. It gives people time to get home and all that good stuff, although it doesn't matter if you're flying to Edmonton. As it turns out, if you're flying to Edmonton from Ottawa, your direct flight leaves at 7 p.m. So, um, all right. So our uh, first speaker was, and I think this is uh, something that we all have to work on, we can all work on, I'm sure some of you are critical of my presentation skills as I'm talking here, um, uh, Professor, sorry, Dr. Andrea Wojnicki, and she talked about uh, some communication tips in sort of rules of threes. So she had a bunch of rules of threes, and as an example, she talked about building a way to do intros where you start with the present, this is who I am, talk about the past, something you've done in the past, and you talk about the future, something that you're aspiring to do. So for example, I might say, I'm Jason Watt, I train financial advisors, I have helped over a thousand people get ready for their financial planning exams, and we are building a capability for Quebec-based advisors to get continuing education credits via a podcast. So that might be a little bit um, wide in terms of its scope, but it's uh, that's present, past, future. Um, and she had lots of stuff like that, lots of sort of rules of threes. I really like this presentation, and she was a really solid presenter. Um, if you're looking for uh, somebody to speak at a conference, again, uh, uh, Dr. Andrea Wojnicki, um, well-educated. She has evidence to back up what she's saying, and um, and I like these sort of Rules of threes, those mnemonic devices, I find it very helpful. All right. Uh, then we had a um, another, and this is the, I can't the second or third presentation where there was some comment about whether 
traditional portfolios are still appropriate. So this was David Wasaki um, from uh, Harvest ETFs, and he presented a covered call option for ETFs. So basically a covered call, this means you own the underlying, so you own the security. So I might buy shares of, just for the sake of argument, Bank of Nova Scotia, and then I hold those shares and I'm going to then sell calls on those shares. And the idea here is you typically wanna sell a call that is um, out of the money far enough that it's not likely to be exercised. So you would get the revenue from selling the call and then the call expires and you're still holding the share of Scotia. Um, the risk there is that if Scotia has a great quarter, if the earnings report comes out or something else happens, where in Scotia has a great quarter, then the call buyer, the call holder is gonna exercise and they're gonna be able to buy your shares of Scotia from you and you're gonna miss out on that big opportunity for big growth. So the idea with covered calls is typically that they sort of smooth out your returns. Um, it's almost like reverse insurance um, in that you're collecting a premium now, so you're collecting a little more premiums, um, but a big event isn't gonna benefit you as much. Um, so you get more sort of regular income, but you miss out on those big gains. And he talked about doing this in a sort of uh, hedged way, wherein they never have more than 33% of their position um, exposed to covered calls. And uh, I get that. Um, I'm not a huge fan myself of covered call strategies. I find that they um, often look good on paper, but we know the reality here is that a lot of gains and securities happen sort of all at one time. Uh, so when you talk about you know bank stock, maybe it's a little smoother, but lots of securities um, have really, really volatile um, gains. And the problem there is you're gonna miss out on the, the best days. So uh, I don't know, I get it. Um, and I guess if I was looking for, oh, and the other thing that was advantageous here, the one thing that I think is worth noting that might give me pause and might, if I had the right kind of client, make me um, use this kind of concept, um, is that it is a way to generate capital gains in a non-registered portfolio. So for the um, investor who's passing their money over to somebody else to let them run the money, uh, the taxation on covered calls in a non-rich portfolio is capital. So you do get that um, lower inclusion rate. Um, I don't think that I like it as a replacement for bonds, though. Um, you're not taking the volatility off the table like you would be with bonds. Okay. Uh, next, we had um, one of my favorite presentations of the entire session. Uh, this was Doug Runchy. Uh, for something like three decades, um, Doug ran the income security programs um, for Western Canada. Um, he retired, and I didn't know this. I, I've actually uh, emailed with Doug back and forth before, and I had his partner, um, not at DR Pensions Consulting, but uh, his partner at the CPP Calculator website, uh, David Field, was on this um, podcast back in season two. Um, and that's a great interview. You go back and listen to David and he knows all the nuances of CPP. I think there was even one question that came up with that interview where he said, you'd have to ask Doug that. So um, Doug knows the nuances even better than David does, let's say. Um, so Doug took us through some of those nuances, um, really focused on um, the calculation of the retirement benefit, and then a little bit of discussion around how the survivor benefit gets calculated. And I found it... Um, quite interesting. Um, the one uh, technical detail that I picked up on here, which I did not realize, was that while CPP has a 17% low earnings dropout period, um, QPP, it's only a 15% low earnings dropout period. So a little subtle difference there. And entirely appropriate because we were in Quebec. So um, yeah, excellent session. And yeah, Doug had said he was, uh, he, sorry, I, I missed this earlier. He said he had retired and he spent 10 years just kind of casually answering people's questions about Canada Pension Plan. And then he thought, I think I could make a little business out of this. And I think he's a little busier than maybe he wanted to be. Um, I find lots of advisors who will email and have their clients get a consultation about their specific um, CPP questions from Doug. And I do encourage it. I've seen some of his work and it's always really good. He does a good job of substantiating um, whatever uh, recommendations he makes. And again, he knows the numbers so well, and he presents them in a way that makes sense to your sort of um, average clients. Okay. Um, we then moved on to um, 
a couple of other short presentations, but the next big presentation was Ben Felix from uh, PWL. I already talked about the fact that I was so happy to get to meet Ben the day before, and he on stage was exactly what you hear on the podcast. Um, very data intensive here, um, level presentation, like he understands his material, he knows exactly what he's doing, and I quite enjoyed this. So nice, uh, nice to get to see Benjamin present in person. Um, there's lots here, and I'm not sure how far I can go with this. I'm not, Ben. Um, but essentially what he talked about here was that we have a professional responsibility to employ modern um, portfolio management techniques. And a lot of what's happening uh, from an academic perspective is based on what happened in the 1950s and 1960s. And he made the point that a lot of the research that showed up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s is not being properly um, represented in how portfolios get built. And he sort of pointed to the difference between the original capital asset pricing model, which really relies on a single factor. So the single factor here being volatility um, in terms of your um, uh, assessment of risk, of investment risk. And he talked about now, um, at least his firm, I know they use a five-factor model. This is the dimensional fund advisors model. And this is where you're taking a lot more factors into account. Now, this has gotten a little bit muddied. Um, and if you listen to Rational Reminder, you'll hear this, that you know the sort of universe expanded to maybe 300 factors. And now it's contracting again. There's a recognition that there are fewer factors than that. So um, it was quite good, quite interesting. And he said, you know, at least we have this ethical responsibility to recognize this. Now, curiously, on his most recent episode of the podcast with him and Cameron, um, their guest came on and said, in fact, there's an argument there to be made for CAPM still being valid, so the, the old single factor model. So um, I'm not saying one is better than the other, whatever the case is, but I think the point here is that under both our professional responsibility with FB Canada, as well as our KYP obligations under the client focused reforms, there has to be some ability to explain why you're using the asset management model you're using. So if you're using a purely passive, if you're using factor-based, if you're using active, if you're using indices, whatever it is you're using, how does that fit with that client focused reforms? And I, I really enjoyed the presentation again. And um, it was kind of funny because we'd seen a whole raft of active managers and then um, you know this big promotion for uh, an index strategy. Anyways, uh, although you could argue that uh, factor base does have an active component to it, so I don't know. Um, we broke into uh, the breakout rooms following that, and I went into Aaron Klug's presentation. Um, he's Epilogue Wills, and I really enjoyed this. Um, he went through just a nice uh, foundational breakdown of what is required to make a valid will and really why um, an online will meets those criteria. And he did a great job too. And this is something I really appreciate of talking about when an online will is not appropriate. So, and I talked about this on a previous episode. I know I talked about uh, getting my kids to use a different online will service to do their wills. And, you know, only there's one that maybe should have, should go see a lawyer, but realistically they're not going to. They haven't even done the online will yet. Uh, but the others, you know, they they are well served by the level of complexity and the price uh, of an online will. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was quite good. And um, I just would mention here my learning on this one. Um, so in British Columbia right now, and I know that uh, I know which company is doing this, but uh, we, British Columbia is the only province right now, and they're in a trial for this that is accepting um, electronic documents as wills in any other province. If you take your will and scan it and have an electronic version of it, it's not valid. But in British Columbia, you can have an electronic will really from front to back. Um, as I understand it, it could be DocuSigned. And as long as we can show that the witnesses were properly there to witness that docu signature, um, then we're okay. So um, Aaron did talk about that a little bit, but he didn't go into uh, sort of tons of concepts around data and so forth. He really focused on the requirements for a will. So a you know, will is um, signed by the testator, great, and witnessed by two witnesses. Those things work, and those things work for online wills as much as they do for um, 
offline wills, paper wills. There we go. Okay. Um, so that takes us to um, the next day then takes us to um, Saturday. And Saturday morning, we kicked off with another uh, one of my favorites, another great presentation here. I, I know I keep saying that, but there were so many really top notch here. And that was Terry Ritchie. And uh, Terry, um, he's uh, some of you will know him from Cardinal Point. He was the MC for a bunch of the event. I think I mentioned that previously. And uh, just a great MC, super gracious, um, just kind of funny, like on a kind of low key level. Um, I, I thought he was. Uh, great presence on stage, great. He knew everybody in the audience, just super guy. Um, I was really happy to get to meet him. Um, anyways, uh, Terry went through kind of, I'm going to say current and hot topics uh, for U.S. clients. He specializes in that cross-border area. Um, so cross-border concerns. And there's not a lot of big new news here, um, but I can never see enough of this. It, it's so complicated and everything is just you know, it comes down to knowing the intricacies of U.S. Uh, versus Canadian considerations, knowing where withholding tax applies and where it doesn't. So we um, we talked about it. Actually, here's a couple of notable things uh, to Terry's presentation. First off, I did not know this. The gift tax exemption has gone up from $14,000 to $16,000. But Terry really explained why the gift tax isn't that big a deal in the short term. Um, more so that the gift tax offsets your estate tax eventually. So we don't have to necessarily worry about Americans paying gift tax when they give stuff to a spouse or a child, for example, but it does reduce their eventual estate tax exemption. And speaking of estate tax, he made the excellent point, and I, I was aware of this, but it's sort of uh, sunk into the back of my mind somewhere. Um, the current estate tax exemption is just a shot over $12 million, uh, which means a couple essentially is about $24 million exempt. And you say, well, that's not that many clients that's going to impact. Uh, if there's no legislative change, that measure will sunset in 2025. And that means starting in 2026, we'll go back to the old $5 million exemption indexed indexation, and it should take that to about six and a half million. So you might be planning around a 24-ish million dollar exemption today, but really maybe it's safer to plan around a $13 million exemption. We'll see what happens. And it depends on the, the will of governments and so forth to uh, to make some change there. And um, finally, uh, the presentation, I, and I, again, I really enjoyed this. This was a great ending to the conference. Um, Harold Geller um, and Jason Pereira did a sort of fireside chat where they talked about suing financial advisors. So um, Harold uh, makes his living suing advisors. And I thought this was um, fantastic. I talked to Harold already um, about getting him on the podcast, as I have with Aaron, actually, that I mentioned a minute ago. So a couple of prospective uh, future podcast guests that I've met here. And um, he went, there was so many good things here, um, but I'm going to go over a couple things. So he talked about when an advisor gets up on the um, on the stand and testifies or in uh, their deposition says that there are no conflicts of interest. Okay? He said, when he hears that, that's like, that's like gold for him. He knows then that he's gonna be able to dismantle whatever argument that person is making. He said, there are always conflicts of interest in these cases. So it might just be compensation, uh, but he pointed to plenty of others, and he and I had a brief offline conversation about this afterwards, and I'm going to get him on here to talk about this. But, you know, we talked about intergenerational conflicts of interest, for example. So when you're dealing with mom and dad and you're dealing with the kids, is there a conflict there? And I've always thought that there was. And, you know, I asked him, and I don't want to put words in his mouth here, but I'm going to say I think he agreed with me that there's almost certainly a conflict there. And he made the point, that's not a reason not to do things. It's okay to have a conflict of interest, but you have to be very clear in that conflicted situation that everybody understands what's happening. What FP Canada requires here is that you would disclose that in writing to the client and then that you, sorry about that. Um, so you would disclose that in writing to the client and the client discloses that comes back to you and says, yeah, I'm okay to proceed with that conflict of interest. Perfectly fine. Okay. Um, he talked about the value of family meetings. Again, uh, I'd love to hear this because I like to talk about family meetings as well as having um, so much value. So just a ton of good points that came up here. 
and I thought it was a, a wonderful ending to the conference. So thanks very much for following along for that. Um, I'll be going back next year. Uh, again, it'll be in Edmonton in September of 2022. So I'd love to see you there. And I learned a ton, and I believe anybody who attends would have a ton of learning opportunities as well. It's Jason Watt. I'm uh, recording this from Denver, Colorado, where I just finished attending the Financial Therapy Association 2022 conference. It was excellent. It was really top-notch and uh, tons of learning. And we're going to talk about this in a moment here uh, that uh, put me outside of my comfort zone and stretched my boundaries. So really uh, great that way. Um, I'm recording in, I, I don't know, my room anymore. I checked out of my hotel and so forth. And I'm recording in a sort of hallway here. So you're going to see uh, some uh, folks who are here for probably the XY Planning Network Conference wandering by me on their way um, to and from the gym, which is just over to my left here. So it's not going to be optimal, but uh, that'll be all right. Okay, um, so I'm going to share the agenda. For those who are watching the YouTube then, you'll see the agenda. For those who are listening, um, I'll talk through it anyways. I just thought it would be a useful graphic for those who are watching. And because it's just me, I don't have anybody that I'm interviewing here. Um, so I'm going to just bring this up. So the agenda, the meetings started on um, Wednesday and um, they did a nice job here. The hotel had a, a nice uh, conference room set up with um, exhibitors and so forth. It's an American conference. Uh, there was only, there's about a hundred people here and uh, four Canadians. I, I knew three of uh, myself and two others that I knew beforehand. And I just met uh, Ian from Vancouver today. So good to meet Ian. And other than that, uh, past podcast guest, uh, Natasha, and probably future podcast guest. I can't believe I haven't had him on actually. Sean, um, we're here as well. So um, really great. And a couple of other, actually one other podcast guest uh, previous was uh, Nate Astle was here. And Nate does a great job of getting out and, uh, let's say, pounding the drum for the good work of the Financial Therapy Association, which is how I got here. Um, so the um, the exhibitors, I just want to highlight here that uh, there's some stuff that we just don't have in Canada. So um, eMoney and yeah, eMoney is an interesting bit of software here. And I know there's some Canadian providers that are working their way into this, but um, one of the best known features of eMoney, I think, is that it gives clients access to a very robust dashboard that includes you know, live updates around not just your investments, but bank accounts and so forth. So a pretty thorough um, client dashboard there. I'm going to talk more about eMoney because they sponsored or they uh, sorry, ran a session later on. They were a sponsor, but they uh, ran a session later on that um, opened my eyes to a couple of things as well. Um, and in terms of the amount of learning I did here, I think I'm, I'm exhausted. Um, I think that this is probably the most that uh, that I can learn in uh, sort of two and a half days. Uh, just so much stuff was outside of anything I ever knew about. So um, really excellent. And then like out of the 100 participants here, I don't know, probably a third of them have PhDs, maybe more. So um, yes, just constantly stretched. Good. I like it. Okay. Um, so you can see here, I didn't go to the um, mindfulness session. I did uh, try to go to the informal group walk run, um, but this was something this group was really good about. Even within the sessions, a lot of times there would be a, a sort of moment of mindfulness. Um, I, I know Ed Combs, whom I'll talk about here in a few minutes, uh, Ed led us on a couple inward outward exercises. Um, this was all really good. It was essentially the inward is, focusing on the people around you and the people with you, taking time to acknowledge them and outward exercises. That's thinking about the people who aren't there in the room and how you're going to impact their lives. So um, I liked it and I can see where some folks would find this too, let's say touchy feely for traditional financial planning, but I, I think there's a place for this kind of thing in at least some financial planning practices. Okay. Um, so the um, intro session here, we start off with a keynote from um, Dr. Antonio Harrison, and uh, this was uh, top notch. He really, first off, just a great keynote, and he um, spoke. He's a sort of a professional speaker, like a professional keynote speaker, um, high school football coach, former college athlete, uh, but really um, lives in sort of the the power of communication 
Um, he talked here a lot about the, the power of words and the value. And I, I know this is stuff that we know. I know that the, we know that everybody's favorite topic, I mean, here I am, I'm gonna talk for an hour. Um, everybody's favorite topic is themselves. So he really emphasized the story you care about most is your own story. And we wanna get people telling their own stories. This was a message I heard over and over again at this conference. Um, I'm gonna, the, the very last session I attended um, uh, reiterated some of this. So the other thing he introduced that I thought was really neat, and I'm gonna find a link and put this in the show notes. Um, he introduced something I've never seen before, sort of a pros and cons called a picnic analysis. And um, this is where you can essentially break a task down into um, into its uh, all the the good results and the bad results. And we do this then picnic. It's three um, sort of uh, trade offs here. So you can see it here on the screen, but essentially you're breaking every item on the, the list here into every result. So you look at what all the results of taking this action are, and you can see whether it's going to be um, positive, negative. And so is it going to have good results or bad results? Is it uh, immediate or future? So is it something that uh, we have to do, that's, we're going to see it right away, or we're going to see it way down the road? And is it certain or uncertain? So we're going to lean more towards the pick part of this. So positive, immediate, and certain. And we're going to lean away from negative, future, sorry, um, negative, future, and uncertain. So this is your um, picnic analysis. And very cool. So the, the idea is that somebody's more likely to do something if we get positive, immediate, certain, and they're less likely to do it if it's negative, future, and uncertain. So we want to get them to the point where the action we're recommending, the thing we're asking them to do is pick. And so that's where if you, if you make a recommendation and it's too much the, the bad stuff, if it's too much negative, future, and uncertain, you want to pare down the recommendation, make the recommendation in shorter term, make it easier. And that's gonna get us to something that's likely to be implemented. So it's a nice, um, uh, let's say mental model for thinking about how we make recommendations. I thought it was a great takeaway and I really appreciate it. You know, it's a, a lot of keynotes, it's more, and this was not true for any of our keynotes at this session. A lot of keynotes, they're you know, very raw, raw, motivational. Um, and he did have elements of that in his talk. Certainly he was an inspiring speaker, um, but he left us with some, some takeaways and he sort of made that promise. He said, I'm gonna leave you with some takeaways here. So I, I really like that. Okay. Um, we then went into uh, the breakouts. And we'll pop back here to the breakouts. So um, this, this is where this session, this whole thing was very challenging because we had um, just boatloads of choices in the breakouts. Um, I'd actually, I'd seen uh, Jay Hill uh, present previously. Um, he did a really great session at CFP Board Academic Research Colloquium a few years ago that uh, connected people up to uh, functional MRI while they were doing um, risk assessment questionnaires, like investment risk assessment questionnaires, and um, found that going through that exercise, I think I talked about this on a previous podcast, um, going through that exercise was actually triggering the same parts of your brain as when you have a pain response. So judge, judge accordingly. All right. Um, then we got into the session I actually attended, though, was the next one, the unbanked status of Black households. Um, and as much as it shows uh, John Grable and Christy Archuleta presenting here, it was really Kimberly Watkins that did most of the presentation. Um, and this is a interesting topic. And I find um, American schools do a lot of this kind of research. They, there's a sort of wide acknowledgement that you know there are differences for Black households in terms of financial outcomes and a lot of work to uh, get to an understanding of that. Um, and in, in this session, we saw um, an estimate, and I think this is probably a pretty good um, estimate here, that 
for an unbanked household. That is somebody, somebody who doesn't have sort of a lifelong relationship with a traditional financial institution. So it could be a bank or a credit union or whatever the case is, um, ends up with about $40,000 lifetime in excess fees paid. And that comes about from just having uh, having to pay um, check cashing services or maybe popping in to have a bank account for a period of time and using overdraft and having interest paid there. So about $40,000 in excess fees lifetime. That's a significant amount of money. And of course, this is a population that can't manage that. Um, and I do wonder here, it's something I haven't seen a lot of research on, um, but I wonder about um, sort of a, a similar uh, set of questions around Indigenous Canadians, and I, I know there's some unbanked population there as well. Um, we talked a little bit about intergenerational concerns here, and this is where um, the um, the presentation took us into the idea of sort of mistrusting banks, and we talked about uh, the uh, firebombing of uh, Greenwood, uh, Oklahoma, in I think it was 1922, I can't remember, but how this idea, this sort of wipeout of what was known as the Black Wall Street, um, really contributes to you know, an intergenerational uh, mistrust of banking. And I thought that was pretty interesting. So kind of a, a depressing talk, but good to see that there's some attention being paid there. Okay, this led us into what was probably the second most discussed session of the entire um, period. And this is where, and I attended this one, I was so happy to have gone to it. Um, uh, pretty risky for me, honestly, this is uh, way outside of my comfort zone. But this uh, session from Deb Kaplan, Erotic Capital, um, and she is a, a sex therapist who also does money work. Um, super interesting. And uh, she said, when she's talking to her sex therapy clients, uh, she says, I'm gonna talk about the M word now, and she talks about money. And we just talk into her um, financial therapy client. She says, I'm going to talk about the M word now and it's masturbation. So she had this joke about the M word. There you go. Um, and I set the tone for the session. Um, and um, she talked in here about uh, sort of kinks and fetishes and said, like, fine, if whatever somebody's doing is safe, sane, and consensual, go ahead. And then she got into some behaviors that were possibly not safe, sane, and consensual. And the specific area, and I had no idea about any of this, the specific area that she talked about is something called FINDOM, as in financial domination. And I guess this is a real thing where, I mean, she had lots of evidence of it and clients who had dealt with it, um, where people um, just pay money to like strangers on the internet instead of paying to be dominated emotionally or whatever you're essentially paying and being dominated financially so very can be a very harmful behavior because you see some people giving away uh, lots of money and, and again fine if it's not hurting you to give away that money but if it's you know causing pain so i don't know if anybody listening to this would ever run into this kind of thing but it's a great example of a behavior that i would say a financial planner is going to have no tools to deal with and this is where it's good to have that relationship with a therapist. And on that note, I actually just wanna break for a second here from the sessions and mention um, Ed Combs recent, so Ed is the incoming president of the Financial Therapy Association. And he was on the Kitsis podcast, the Michael Kitsis uh, Financial Advisor Success podcast, um, just fairly recently over the summer here, if I recall correctly. And he talked about normalizing uh, mental health conversations in the financial planning discussion, at least having the idea that it's normal to deal with a mental health professional. And where I'm going to get some background chatter here. Sorry, there's lots of folks wandering through right now. Um, but he said one of the things to consider is on your intake form. So at the point where you ask a client who their lawyer is, who their accountant is, who their investment advisor is, whatever other allied professionals you're asking about, consider asking who the mental health professional they deal with is, or maybe just do you deal with a mental health professional? And that sort of normalizes the idea that then when something like this comes up, and it might not be as, uh, let's say, unusual as this, um, that it's it's acceptable in the financial planning discussion to say, you know, have you talked about this with your therapist? Or can I refer you to a therapist who might be able to help you here? So I thought it was a nice overlap with that. We know there are things, and I'm sure lots of people listening have had this, where you've had a conversation with your client where you think, 
I'm talking about like their marriage now, maybe that's outside of my scope of practice, or I'm talking about their relationships with their children, maybe that's outside my scope of practice. There's lots of these kinds of conversations we had over the, the three days of the conference that would be you know, comfortable, normal conversations for the therapist and probably a stretch for the financial planner, financial advisor. Okay, um, we rolled then into a session, another set of breakout sessions, again, always a challenge. And I attended an uh, emotional budgeting session with um, Dr. Alex Malkumian. Um, Alex has, uh, I think, a pretty good reputation among the financial therapy community. He's uh, very much a thought leader and uh, just came out with a book so uh, called um, Financial Psychology. I wish I had a copy. I should have grabbed a copy while I was here. Um, but anyways, um, he talked about, and there's actually two ways to interpret the title of this session. The emotional budget means you have only so much capacity to deal with the sort of world around you to deal with whatever's happening. And that we really have to be respectful of people's emotional budget when we're de uh, delivering financial advice. And that's something that as a financial planner, we can be aware of. And in fact, this shows up a little bit now in the CFP curriculum as well, um, where we talk about a very similar concept called cognitive load, basically this idea that you only have so much mental capacity to deal with whatever's at hand. And as a financial planner trying to have useful recommendations with your client, there's some benefit to thinking about whether or not that person is really engaged. Are they in the best possible position right now to have this conversation? Um, and he reminded us here that uh, how we feel influences what we see. So if somebody is in an emotionally drained state and you present a concept to them, they may not respond well to that concept. You might really have then soured that idea for the rest of any sort of uh, time working with that person. And that's something else that we saw a lot of in this conference, um, this idea that there really is a burden on the financial advisor, financial planner, financial therapist, that when the client doesn't respond well, that we should really look inward, look at how we've delivered that advice, look at how we built the relationship, look at the foundations for it, look at the environment in which we delivered. And instead of saying, you know, it's the client's fault that they didn't take action, is there something that the planner or advisor could have done differently or was you know, was everything that, that you did perfect? So were you delivering advice in you know, bite-sized chunks that that person could understand using language they could understand? Was the advice delivered in an environment where that person was likely to, to take action? So um, lots there. And really that was a recurring message through the whole conference. Okay, we then rolled into um, somebody who's really um, very much a, Um, sorry, I, I got for so the, you'll see the poster sessions on here. That turned me off for a second. I apologize. So we did have these poster sessions, um, and these are sort of people who submitted papers or ideas, and maybe the research wasn't all the way there to be able to present in the conference, um, but still interesting ideas. And I spent a fair bit of time talking to Professor. Betts Hamilton here, Axton Betts Hamilton from South Dakota State. And she had two papers here on familial identity theft. And this was an interesting one. And I think I had just this morning that I attended the session, um, listened to a podcast from Holland Estates. And if you've listened to me previously, I recommend Holland Estates. And they talked about a case in which a, um, and I'm maybe not going to get the fact exactly right, but it was a fairly recent Ontario case. A fellow had won the lottery, small lottery, about $77,000. It was a lot of money for him and his family, but not a lot of money you know, compared to a lot of lottery winnings. Um, he died soon after. Um, nobody informed his bank that he had died, and his mother still had his debit card and apparently knew his PIN. His mother was immobile, but his sister would drive his mom through the ATM. So they would go through sort of, you know, as many times as they had to, to $500 at a time to clean out that $77,000. And the question here was whether the sister was liable for that. And the courts determined that she was. So I found it interesting. It was a, you know, a concrete example of this familial identity theft, sort of pretending to be somebody in your family uh, to steal their money. I see some of this as well with my pro bono financial planning clients. Um, there's some overlap here with uh, human trafficking, of course. 
So, um, and we heard some of that in um, our recent episode on human trafficking as well. So um, lots there. And um, again, not something that maybe you would expect to see in a financial planning engagement, but when you get into clients who have reduced capacity issues, or even maybe somebody who has full capacity, but reduced mobility, like my wife right now, no driver's license. And you know maybe you have somebody gives away their debit card in a case like that, or gives away a credit card. Okay, then we got into the session with Rich Kaler, um, rescripting money scripts. So um, a lot of you, and I've used this actually as an item at the beginning of an episode before, uh, Rich is one of the authors on the very well-known book, I think probably a book everybody in the session had read um, called uh, Financial, oh, I've forgotten the title now, sorry, Financial Therapy Tools, Facilitating Financial Health, I believe. And this is really the book where he, um, it's not where he introduced money scripts that was done in an earlier paper, but this is the book where the idea of money scripts is really fully fleshed out. And he talked about um, sort of where he's at with thinking about money scripts. Um, and this was an interesting session. Um, he reminded us here that whatever money scripts we have are written internally in response to external stimulus. And he put us through this fairly difficult exercise wherein um, he had us uh, visit our money scripts. And this introduced something that I wasn't really aware of in therapy. I've, not, I've, I've, I've engaged in therapy here and there over the years, but I've never been a, a regular um, sort of consumer of therapy. And he got into um, this family therapy, this systems, finance, uh, systems therapy concept, which basically takes the thing that is sort of, I'm gonna say problematic here, I don't know if that's the right word, and you treat that like a separate person. So for me, for example, um, I, if I do the clients money scripts inventory, um, I'm going to rank fairly high on the workaholism scale. This might not be a surprise to you. I'm in sunny Denver on a Saturday afternoon recording a podcast when I should be out enjoying the sights of the city. Um, but there you go. Um, so he talked about these, um, this money script and you know, I have to think about, you know, in this sense, I, I'm asking my workaholism where it came from. I'm thinking about this consciously and, you know, trying to sort of give that behavior its own personality. Um, pretty tough exercise, pretty interesting. And I can see the benefit of this kind of thing. I don't know that that's something that if I were a financial planner, I'd want to get my clients trying to do. Um, we, we actually had a session the next day, I'll talk about later on here with, um, with Dr. Kaler, where he, he went through a, a real, like we, we got to see a live therapy exercise. And uh, yeah, he definitely has some tools in his toolbox that I would probably never have. Okay, uh, on to the second day then. And I'll just start with our keynote for the second day. This is Professor uh, Todd Cashton. And he talked about um, the power of, I'm gonna say curiosity here. He had sort of three themes in his message. But the biggest takeaway I had was about curiosity. So I talked about diversity, courage, and courage and curiosity. I, I like the diversity perspective here. The idea was that you know we think about diversity maybe in terms of diversity of race or diversity of background or diversity of gender. Um, but he talked about diversity of your, let's say, um, desire for new experiences. He sort of picked on folks in the room that were. Um, you know, a little more dull in the, the choices they would make versus people who would go uh, engage in risk seeking behaviors and said, you know, have you ever thought about diversity in a team that way? It's good. I, I don't know how much applicability there is in a sort of small financial planning practice for that. But I thought it was a neat take on diversity that it's, you know, diversity of opinion, diversity of desire for experiences. That, that was pretty good. Um, and then he took us into, and I'd never heard this before, the Zigernuck effect. And this is the idea that we can use curiosity as a tool. And I actually still don't know how his story ended. I just realized this. Um, so he started telling a story and then just left us hanging right in the middle of the story. And twice since then, somebody has said, I'm gonna tell you how the story ends and they still haven't. So I don't know what went wrong there. Um, but anyways, the idea here is that we can get somebody thinking usefully about a concept by, you know, not always finishing the idea. Sometimes helpful here to to leave somebody hanging a little bit. You know, just think about like successful TV shows, like Who Shot Jr. If that's helpful, or Who Shot Monty. If that's maybe more your speed. Um, 
and this idea that we can really get somebody engaged and working with us if we can use that bit of curiosity. And that goes against something our sometimes our natural tendency, which is that we want to have completion in every meeting. We want to make sure that we get every idea out. There's nothing wrong from this perspective, from Professor Cashton's perspective, nothing at all wrong with um, saying, okay, we're an hour into our meeting, we've done this much work, and you know, we still have more work to do, we will come back to it and leaving some of that um, undone. So I thought that was good. And I think that's I think that's a tool you can use in financial planning. I think there's some benefit there versus having to you know, finish everything 100% every time. Okay, um, then we had some round some uh, round tables here. These were essentially breakout rooms. These were a little bit more discussion oriented. And I attended the eMoney one. I was interested in, I am interested in the software. Again, lots of US software that doesn't, uh, that's not available in Canada. Um, and I leaned on the advice. I, I had a brief conversation with one of the folks from eMoney before the session. And she asked me about expanding into Canada. I said, you know, uh, if you take Jason Prayer's advice, Jason, of course, past podcast guest and host of the, um, sort of the FinTech Impact podcast. And Jason always says, like he really cautions people about um, entering Canada. It's a tough uh, tough market to, to come into because the lack of an open, open banking infrastructure and some other regulatory issues. So there you go. Um, anyways, the, the two presenters here, um, Seisha, I don't know if Seisha's last name, sorry. And then Dr. Emily Kuchel. Um, so this, this I loved, Dr. Emily, um, you know, professor, She's got a background, like a an academic, strong academic background in financial and family planning, and financial planning and, and family dynamics, right? And to have, like, I thought to have somebody on staff like that, who's really using all the the data and sort of tools that are available with any money, and then turning that out, turning that around into you know more useful tools for financial planners, um, just to have like an academic engaged in that way. I never even really thought about it. And um, I think that, you know, when you look at taking all of that information and then having the ability to, to have better financial planning tools, just uh, top notch here. Okay, uh, the next presentation was another keynote and this was um, Elaine King. Um, Elaine, one of the few presenters without a PhD, I think. So uh, MBA though, she had an MBA and uh, she's a practitioner. Um, really a pure practitioner. And she spoke about family dynamics here a fair bit. Um, and the thing that I took away from this was she talked about family governance and talked about this as a sort of distinct effort. She deals with a bunch of sort of multi-generational wealth, families with, with real money where they're passing on wealth from one generation to the next. And she talked here about the family constitution. And this would be a tool that's kind of adjunct to a shareholder agreement so the family corporation might have its shareholder agreement, and we might have you know, trust documents governing how trust assets are handled. But the family constitution is more of a document that explains themes around how the family deals with money and transition and how decisions are made. So it's not a legal document. It's more of a, you know, here's best practices. Here's how we're gonna conduct ourselves. Here's what we're gonna do for meetings. Um, this was very interesting. And uh, those of you who heard me talk about family meetings, this is like that family meeting idea uh, really amplified substantially. So I enjoyed that talk. That was a, an interesting talk. And again, just something a little bit different from what we would normally think about. Okay. Um, I then attended a breakout session here with Dr. Preston Cherry. He's the outgoing president of the Financial Therapy Association. And this was really about the classic personality traits. So um, he used Big Five. You've heard me talk here before about Big Five and see them here. So it's OCEAN. OCEAN is the, the um, acronym for our Big Five. We've got openness, conscientiousness, extroversion um, or extroversion, agreeableness and neuroticism. And the idea here is that everybody's gonna represent somewhere on a scale. There's a bunch of free tests you can do to see where you sit. And this has become the, the widely accepted standard for personality testing. There's a lot of sort of um, pseudoscience around this, but this is where we see some actual um, 
well, this is this is what gets used in science. So this is interesting. You know, Dr. Cherry is both a practitioner and an academic and a volunteer as well. And um, he talked about um, how these personality traits show up. And he did talk a little bit about sort of the characteristics here and what characteristics um, lead to what behaviors. But more so, he talked about this from the practitioner's perspective. So he he actually does a brief assessment, a short 20 question assessment, I think maybe 10 questions, a short assessment anyways, as part of his pre-screening with clients. And then he knows when the client comes to see him, um, roughly where that person sits on these ocean scales. And he says, and he's, you know, he's done this for years, he's used to this, he says he uses that then to influence how he uh, deals with the client, you know, once they start into conversations. And it just seems like another good tool to have in the toolbox. I did specifically ask him if he thought it had to be like a PhD to do this. And he said, no, he said he thinks that, you know, any financial planner could adopt this kind of thing just with a little bit of practice. So uh, I thought that was pretty good. And uh, his quote here, I can't guarantee investment results, but I can guarantee transformative change. And uh, I thought that was pretty good. He said, if you work with me, you're going to have transformative change. That's a, is a very positive message. And he delivers it with a lot more enthusiasm than I did, um, but really good. Okay. It is 10 questions, or I see my notes there at the 10 question quiz he uses. All right. Um, so then I attended a session here. And you'd think it wouldn't be that relevant for Canadians, but I thought, um, nice to understand what's happening in the American experience. Um, this session on medical debt, stress, and life satisfaction, um, led by Dr. Emily Johnson, sorry, soon to be Dr. Emily Johnson, and uh, and then Dr. Bruce Ross. Um, I hope I haven't just jinxed her. I, I don't have that kind of power. I know that. So, and uh, yeah, she was top notch. So um, she talked about um, how medical debt shows up in uh, bankruptcy here, and how it shows up in in other areas. So. Um, talked about the idea that often when somebody is stretched, and this is the U.S. example, is not Canadian, when somebody is stretched financially, that health insurance is often the first thing to go. People don't want to let their mortgage go. They don't want to let you know kids' education savings go. But if they if they have a choice, they'll often let their health insurance go. Um, and the um, the thing I hadn't really thought about here. Um, was, you know, we hear about whether U U.S. folks have health insurance or not, but we talked about plenty of examples of people who had health insurance and it still wasn't sufficient. So you know, questions here, um, are you covered? Okay. But then also, is it enough? And then are there exclusions? And what we found is that a lot of times people don't know this until it's too late. So that that is, even if, you, you know, the policies are very robust and there's a lot of um, ambiguous language in them. Um, a lot of it depends, and that can be hard to deal with. Okay, the next session, I'm actually going to talk about a session I didn't attend for a moment here, um, and this is with Sean Maslick. Sean is from Edmonton. Uh, some of you might know Sean, and he, if you listen to his podcast, uh, The Most Hated F Word, you know that he occasionally has this musician on their root hub, and what will happen is root hub listens to the whole interview Sean does with his guest and then like on the fly it's super impressive um composes a, a song about whatever financial concepts they've talked about um and so Sean brought Root Hub along and I guess it was like almost the whole conference attended this one instead of the um the medical debt conference session so uh you know good for Sean he really filled the room and got a lot of good energy going um, I heard tons of people talk about how much they enjoyed singing and really how, like, how can we do more of this kind of thing? And I think this is great. I know that Sean really loves the idea of making finance more fun. And yeah, this is, um, this is a really good example of it. So, you know, if you're looking for an interesting client event or that kind of thing, maybe reach out to Sean and see um, how he can help you out with that. He's, I know he's very willing to share. That's exactly what he was doing here. And I know that he would happily talk to anybody who's looking to make finance more fun for their clients. So um, very cool. And from you know very bright people, I heard nothing but great things about Sean's session. I do have some FOMO about not having attended it, but here we are. All right. Um, so then we had um, Rick Kaler 
um, as our last, Rich Kaler, I, I, sometimes by Rick and sometimes Rich, I know this, it was a little confusing anyways, uh, Rich Kaler. And he basically, he just played a video in this session um, of him actually delivering um, this internal family systems, that's IFS, internal family systems um, therapy. And this is sort of what I talked about in the earlier session where, you know, I had to address my workaholism. We had somebody here who had a, a specific spending problem. This person was spending money in a place that was making them uncomfortable. They knew they were spending too much money there. And you like this was financial therapy really right at the coal face where um, he, you know, he had thoughtful questions. He really asked questions that got the, you know, the other, like he, he hardly did any talking probably maybe 10% of you know a 45 minute presentation was him talking and virtually everything else was either silence and there was some good you know uncomfortable silence here and then the the patient or client talking was you know most of the other 90% it was it was so good this way and you could see that you know she was really and it was a real session she you know she had her permission to record and share it and um, this really for me emphasized where there's a clear distinction between financial therapy and financial planning, because he was asking questions, you know, about getting her to talk to her inner child and uh, talking about, you know, the specific events from her childhood that led her to this kind of spending. And he shared the, the feedback that he'd gotten after the session. And, you know, she regularly updated him after the session. And yeah, the, the, like these, it was really two one hour interventions and it worked, it, it changed her spending. She said, I, she didn't even know who she was afterwards because she wasn't hooked on this spending. She said it was actually kind of uncomfortable um, not being so dependent on this, this spending pattern. So um, really very good. And I, I wish we had more um, financial therapists operating in Canada. There's you know, uh, Moira Summers, for example, um, there's uh, one lady listed on the Financial Therapy Association website who does um, financial therapy. Um, Natasha Knox, previous podcast guest, is on there in a coaching capacity, but not a not a therapy capacity. Um, so, yeah, it was it was so good. And it was just what I talked about. It was locate that you know that part of you, that system that is responsible for that behavior. And you're really addressing that. And it, literally this, like this person was addressing that behavior, talking to that behavior. Um, very good. Okay. And that rolls us into the last day. Um, and here we had, uh, I attended Sybil Solomon session here, gender and money attitudes. And again, this is an attempt by me to, um, you know, get into stuff that I'm not familiar with. And it was kind of funny, actually, because she um, led into the session and she said, you know, I was hoping to find big differences in money attitudes um, by gender. Um, and she she really said, in the end, you know, a lot of what we see in terms of what you see in the popular press or whatever about money attitudes, it doesn't hold up to about money attitudes being different by gender does not actually hold up to scrutiny. And she pointed out that, you know, in her um, background research for the session, um, she said, you can really find research to support any position. So if you want to say like women are better savers, you can find research to support that. Or if you want to find research to say, you know, men are better savers, you can find research to support that. So she said she pulled a fair bit of data from a site called Money Habitudes. And she said there, um, based on that data, those differences really don't hold up to scrutiny. Um, now, one great thing I heard here, I thought this was, and this was from somebody actually sitting in the audience, and I don't know her name and I apologize, but um, she said, when it comes to um, shopping, she said she really replaces, she replaces the word shopping in her conversations with procurement. Um, and this is this, and I, like, this is my household. This exactly happens in my household. If my wife said, and I do a lot of shopping right now, my wife can't drive. And so, you know, and it's on, I'm out and I'll stop on the way home. So, but I will buy exactly what is on the list. Okay. I am, you know, like if I'm going to Safeway, I am going to go, I know exactly where the stuff that I need is. The most frustrating thing I can have happen is that it's something that's not a familiar buy for me and I have to go looking for it. Um, so 
you know, I, I buy like exactly what's on that list. And that means, you know, if it was left to me, there'd never be anything different, interesting or whatever in the household. And I wouldn't think about, you know, the grandkids are coming in two weeks and we have to get this or I'm just not great with that kind of thing. Whereas what my wife does, I think fits into this procurement category. You know, she goes and she gets a shopping cart and she walks up and down the aisles and I'll go with her for this. And I, I don't find it painful, although she thinks I do. Um, she accuses me of such. And I, I would find it painful if we had to do it every day. That's what I would find painful. And sh she's in procurement mode here. She's really thinking about what has to be acquired that, you know, makes our house a house. So it makes our home a home, however you want to frame that. And I thought that was really good framing. And I think that's something that maybe you can think about introducing into your own practice is instead of talking about, you know, spending or shopping or whatever, let's think about procurement. That's such a more positive spin. I thought that was really good. Okay. And the session that I wrapped up with here, the last session I attended, the last session that was possible to attend um, was again, something where I was, and I thought about the eye gazing session. I did want to go to this. Um, it might be recorded. I might be able to watch it afterwards with, uh, with Professor Ed Combs, um, the incoming president of the Financial Therapy Association. But the one I went to was the ADHD session. Um, and this was with Professor Christine Hargrove. Sorry, she's not a professor. I apologize. Um, anyways, um, she's a researcher and um, she talked about ADHD. First off, it's uh, vastly un underdiagnosed. I know there's this sort of story out there, this uh, uh, I don't know, water cooler talk that it's overdiagnosed, but she said, no, the, the stats don't support that. Um, and this was really um, a message about careful communication. And to my mind, the stuff she talked about here um, was all stuff that was designed to help you deal with folks who who have ADHD, the neurodi neuro neurodivergence, sorry. And um, everything she talked about, though, I thought was ways that anybody would want to be communicated with. So, and I love this framing. She said, "In your client's financial story, are you Batman or are you are you Yoda? So, Batman, like you're the hero and you're doing everything, or are you Yoda?" That is, are you there to help them show them that they can do everything? And I think that's a really great framing for this. I think that we want to be Yoda. I assume that's the case. Um, so that alone was worth the price of admission. Um, but there was a lot more here. Um, so, um, and this is something I hear a lot. And um, I've heard, you know, Jason Pereira talks about this. And I think he he's wise to say this. All behavior makes sense in context. So, you know, we say, I don't understand why that person did that. Well, th there's always a reason. There's always something we can trace back to. And we have to recognize that, that people do things because of the, the events that have led them to where they are. Um, she pointed out, and this is something that shows up in Moira Summers' excellent book as well, Advice That Sticks, that when we make a recommendation that we wanna pay attention to what she called the invisible steps. So, you know, we take it for granted that, you know, Make it like go talk to your banker and talk about you know when you're going to renew your mortgage, and I just write down one step, talk to your banker. But really, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. There's you know you have to book an appointment to talk to the banker. You have to you know find what information you have right now about your mortgage. You have to then go and sit with that person and have an actual conversation about the mortgage. You want to make sure that when you do it, you're in a good frame of mind. So. That's what she said here is call out those invisible steps. Make sure that when you give that advice, you're giving the advice in a way that that the person is actually most likely to implement it. It's, you know, if you make a recommendation that's not, that doesn't include those invisible steps and that person doesn't follow up on it, well, what's it worth? And and who's that on then that they didn't follow up on it? So I thought that was great. And it, it was advice for uh, folks with ADHD, but I really think it applies to everybody. Um, she talked about interventions here, um, that interventions need to be at the point of performance. And this is where it's not, again, it's not good enough just to say, you know, go and meet with your banker. We have to make sure that if that person's had a hard time with that kind of activity, that we are there at the moment of performance, that, that there's tools in place. And, you know, you're not gonna be there in the meeting with the banker, but that you're making sure that that person is, you know, ready that they have the right tools at hand at the right time here. 
Um, and she talked about something that uh, might get you kicked out of your office, but she said, when you're you know, struggling with, uh, with a concept, uh, verbalize it, say it out loud. And I know some people like to do this. I hear this in exam prep classes sometimes where people say, I wish I could talk through the exam. And you really can't do that. But you know, she gave this example. She said, when you're struggling with um, executing a concept, you're you know, um, procrastinating, the pocket I would say, future Jason will be grateful. So um, future Ian will be grateful and then you'll get that thing done. I don't think Ian has this problem, but um, you know, future Peter will be grateful. Good. And um, we want to then expect setbacks. Setbacks are a sign of uh, a positive change. Um, if we don't have setbacks, there's no pain, there's no change happening there. So be ready for those setbacks. So um, that was the whole conference. And I really, and sorry, that was uh, Christine Hargrove. I don't think I mentioned her name. Um, but really on the whole, we emphasized a lot of things that I hear in presentations where we're talking about client communication, things that just make sense. We are responsible for helping our clients implement the steps that they have to implement to make their lives better, that we can communicate to them in a way that's most likely to, to have them implement those steps and to recognize as well, and this for me was a big takeaway from this session, to recognize as well that we are not therapists, that the financial planners and financial, list, financial advisors listening to this are not therapists and that we have to recognize then where we have to pass that client over to that mental health professional. And I think having awareness of that and really being comfortable with being able to do that. And I shared that tip from Ed earlier, that idea of you know, gathering information early, who's your lawyer, who's your accountant, who's your mental health professional. And that normalizes that idea that there's that linkage between you know, emotion and money. And you know, I think that if you just frame it that way, like a client, you think there's emotion in how we treat money, you know, everybody's gonna recognize that there is. So, all right, thanks very much for uh, joining me and enjoy your continued studies. Uh, the number for today's episode is four. The number is four. I hope you join me again in two weeks when I have the final conference of the very busy part of the conference season. There's still the Financial Planning Week conference, which will have happened, I believe, by the time you watch this recording. Um, but the um, final uh, conference that I'm attending in this busy round of conferences is the CFP Board Academic Research Colloquium. I really enjoyed the conference I've already attended since I am uh, recording this, and you'll hear um, lots of, I think, useful uh, discussion in that episode. So thanks very much, and please do join us again in two weeks. Enjoy your continued studies. Hi, if you're listening to this episode and you're not already signed up for CE credits, this is a very easy thing to do. Just navigate over to businesscareercollege.com, and you're going to sign up here for CE Just subscribe. Uh, currently, the pricing is $200 a year. Um, we may be uh, introducing monthly pricing at some point, but as of today, we have a cost of $200 a year. And once you're signed up, then you can just go and listen to every episode within your subscriptions. So you'll use the once you're logged in. You'll use my subscriptions here, and you'll just go to the latest episode, which you'll scroll down to very near the bottom for. Um, it doesn't matter which episode, you just scroll down and you find the one. So as of the time I'm recording this, the most recent episode is season four, episode 27. I can just start it right from here. I can do the quiz here. Um, once I'm done the quiz, then I can get my continuing education certificate. Very straightforward. Um, so I would just um, launch the course here and I can watch the episode from here. Uh, now, if you happen to be already listening to it on YouTube or whatever the case is, you can just navigate right into the quiz, you start your quiz, and you're just going to go through um, the whole thing. And then at the end of it, you'll be able to see your certifications. So we're going to bring up uh, designing small group products. We bring this up. And we click on um, wall certificate, and that's going to give me the CE certificate I need in order to maintain status wherever I happen to 
uh, need CE credits. So I really do encourage, I know that uh, out of our regular listeners, about 40% of you are listening to the episode for CE credits. That's about 60% who you know, are listening out of general interest or whatever it is. Um, and I really think this is an easy way to get your CE credits, 200 bucks a year, pretty reasonable price. And as you can see from the certificate here, so, and as you hear me discuss at the beginning of the episode, we have a broad range of approvals for all of our courses. I'd like to thank uh, Joe Tong. Joseph is our editor, both for video and audio content. And Joe does a lot of good work to make sure that these episodes look and sound good, despite my better efforts. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Maria Nguyen. Maria makes sure that the episodes all get approved for CE credits. Uh, Veronica Tiber does the quality assurance through that process. And then we have a strong marketing team that makes sure that all of our content gets out there so that people can find us and uh, take advantage of the learning opportunity they might not have known about. 